Welcome to this video, my name is Barry Beckham. Allow me to take you through a typical manipulation of a raw infrared image. And if infrared isn't something you've ever given much thought to, before you click out of this particular video, perhaps I can suggest you stay with me for just a few minutes longer. The manipulation process that we're about to use isn't something unique or different just because we're working on an infrared image. The techniques are the same ones we would use to create a monochrome image. Like all the images we may process through Adobe Camera Raw, which is what we're going to do here, or Lightroom, we must go where the image takes us. And what I mean by that is that every image is unique. It's unique in content, subject type, color, contrast, and exposure. This means that when we come to process a raw image, we need to think on our feet and react to the image we have on screen because they won't all require the same approach, similar perhaps, but not the same. Now this necessary variation in our image editing, depending on the image we're working on, is what often contributes to that Photoshop reputation for being hard to learn. On top of this, no two people will approach image editing in quite the same way. There's no easy black and white right or wrong answer. All I can say here is this is my way. Now one of the problems when we take the plunge into infrared photography is that we generally have to commit a camera to be converted to actually shoot infrared. The conversion process is to remove the infrared blocking filter in front of the sensor and replace it with a visible light blocking filter. Now this is generally done by a camera technician and there's quite a number of those around who can do this work for you. Incidentally, that visible light blocking filter is what's causing this slight magenta cast you can see with the image I currently have open in Adobe Camera Raw. Once the camera is converted, it's locked into infrared shooting only. This is the only real practical way where you can handhold your camera, where you can predict results and therefore enjoy infrared photography a lot more. When you consider just how much money we can expect to get back from an old camera when we come to trade up, that's the time perhaps when we need to consider converting the old camera and trying infrared. I have to tell you it's pretty compelling and an interesting subject. While preparing my introduction to this video I had a thought. If infrared is some fringe form of photography that really doesn't stand up from a quality point of view within the photographic establishment why is it that it's so often banned from mainstream photographic competitions? Generally speaking, you don't ban something that doesn't stand any chance of doing well, do you? No, you ban and restrict what may steal the limelight. So I'll leave you with that thought as we get started. Whenever we do any image editing, as I said in the introduction, we need to go where the image takes us. The first problem we have here is to deal with that magenta cast. It's not strong, it's not a problem. All we need to do is just pick up that saturation slider and remove all of the color. My next step is to go to my lens corrections. Now it's not vitally important, of course, that we tick the box to remove chromatic aberration because we're working now on a monochrome image. But routine isn't a bad thing to get into. So I'm going to tick both of these boxes. You'll see a slight change in the image as I tick to enable the profile. And the profile from the lens that I used is automatically applied to the image we have on screen. Now I can go back to my basic tab because I need to think about what we're going to do next and where I'm actually going with this image. Now I need a little bit of guidance to know exactly what to do next so I'm going to look up at the top right to the histogram. There we can see we've got quite a good spread of tones. We can see we've got a little bit of a deficiency in the blacks on the left. We can also see that maybe we can tweak the highlights and certainly the whites and maybe even the exposure just a little bit. 
So what we could do here to make sure we don't go too far with those highlights, we could click to bring in the clipping warnings on both the highlights and the shadows. But next I'm going to go down to my exposure and I'm just going to tweak it up a little bit, just give it a little bit of sparkle. You can see that histogram moving. Now you can see where the real problem lies. It's in the dark pixels on the left hand side. So I'm going to go down here and just tweak the blacks, the shadows a little bit first. You can see the histogram moving. But I think the blacks are going to have an effect. I can also look at the whites. If I go too far, that's the warning sign we need to avoid like the plague. But I don't need to go anywhere near there. And what we're witnessing here is the low contrast range of infrared images, which is great because it gives us lots of scope in the image editor. Next thing I'm going to is my clarity. I'm going to give that a healthy slug. Now you can see we're losing a little bit of detail in the shadows, but it's very minimal and it's not vital. In fact, I'll turn that off because I found that we can accept blocked up shadows in small areas like that much easier than we can accept blown out highlights. But we still, I think, could squeeze a bit more contrast here. I'm going to go back up to my exposure, looking at the histogram again. Just move it a little bit to the right, a bit more sparkle. Maybe a little bit of highlights, a little bit more whites. You can see I'm just beginning to lose the clouds on the left hand side, so I'll come back from that. Now I think that's looking pretty good, but I think the foreground is a little on the weak side. I think I'll push the clarity a little bit, maybe even a little bit of dehaze. And now we're starting to get a real nice bit of sparkle coming through. It's showing up one or two little dust spots that I've got in the sky, and I think perhaps we can deal with those next. What I'm going to do is to go up to the top of the screen and select my spot removal tool and I'm going to use it set to heal. You can see the size of the brush I've got, it's not that big, but I'm going to tick the box down here to visualize the spots and we've got a slider to make them a bit more evident, but you can see there's a couple there but nothing really significant. We can see we've got a strong one there which I'll tap to deal with and hasn't done a fantastic job there. Let me move that a bit. Not done a great job there. Let me try and do that again. Let's click again. That's a bit better. We've got a faint one there. We've got a faint one there. We've got one or two up. Or oh, there's the worst one, I think, right in the middle. We'll deal with that. I think these are just little bits of cloud. It's a personal choice if you want to deal with those. And there was one down in the water, which I'm having difficulty seeing now. So we may have to leave that until we get the image back on screen. And I'll remove the visualized spots and we'll be able to see that. There you can see it. There seems to be one there and one there. I'm going to make my brush a little smaller. Just click in that position. And that one too. And while I'm here, I'll deal with a little blemish there, which is drawing my attention. But I'm looking around and I think we've got them mostly done. So I'm going to go back to my hand tool here. I'm going to touch the H key to bring me back to the sliders and the options on the right hand side. And sometimes when you're working like this, we need a few minutes as what I call a timeout. Now when I talk about a timeout, I just mean that we put down the mouse, or in my case, the graphics tablet pen, sit back in the chair and just look at the picture for a few minutes. If you can walk away, and come back later on. If you can save what you've done by clicking done on the bottom right corner and come back tomorrow, sometimes that's even more beneficial. Now I'd still like to squeeze a little more contrast into this image and if I go to my dehaze here, I'm going to move that slider to the right and as I do, I like what it's doing in the majority of the image, particularly the foreground, the top of the sky and the left and right edges. But maybe it's making the middle distance just a little too dark. So I'm going to take that up a little bit. Then I think I'll go up to my zoom tool at the top left of the screen, double click that 
That brings the image automatically up to 100% magnification because I just want to look at the noise that I have in the sky a little bit closer in detail. Bearing in mind that you're viewing a slightly compressed video, the noise here for an infrared shot is pretty good. But one of the things I often do is go to my detail section and just increase the luminance a little bit just to take the edge off of that noise, just to smooth it a little bit. I'm very careful on how much I give it. You can go far too far and make things far too smooth and unnatural but a little bit of smoothness is okay. And then I'll hit Control 0 which will fit the image back on screen. Now here I think I've got an example of what I was saying in the introduction about going where the image takes you. I still feel that the bottom of that foreground is just a little bit too light and maybe the sky at the top. So I'm going to take a look at putting in a couple of graduated filters. So let's select the filter from the top of the screen. I'll do the sky first by clicking and dragging. just want to come down a little bit. We can sometimes, we'll always pick up the last changes we made. So sometimes I find it convenient to right click within the gradient tool bounding box and reset the correction settings so I can start from scratch. And another little tip which I find useful is to touch the V key. All it's done is to hide that selection. It hasn't got rid of it so I've still got the opportunity to make changes but I don't have that line in the way to draw my eye. So what I want to do here is just darken that sky down a little bit. I think that's all I really need. Now I want to put a gradient down at the bottom. Now because I've got the gradient hidden, unless we touch the V key again, we won't see the bounding box we're about to create. It's not vital, but for the sake of this video, I'll do that. Click and drag up. Now you can see there that the same settings that I put in the sky is working rather well here. What I'm going to do at this point, because I'm happy with the vast majority of my image, I just like to lift the tones in the center. But to do that, first I'm going to open this into Photoshop. And you'll notice the button says Open Object, because I'm opening up a smart object. You can turn on the ability to open up a smart object from the hyperlink right at the bottom of the screen. Click it. There's the little box you need to tick to open in Photoshop as a smart object. And a smart object just means that we can come back into Camera Raw as many times as we wish. Now once the image opens up into Photoshop we can always tell that we're working on a smart object by that little symbol that's sitting at the bottom right corner of the thumbnail. What I'd like to do though is to make a copy of this because I want to open up another version of this to adjust those tones in the center of the image. To do that I need to go to the right of the thumbnail, right click and choose New Smart Object via a copy. Now the benefit of doing what I've just done there is that both of these are now independent layers meaning if I click or double click this one it'll be straight back into Camera Raw and I can make a change independent to this one. So let me go down to the bottom layer. I'll double click and you'll see how quick and easy this is. Because what I want to do here is just take up or take off some of that darkness in the center. Maybe I'll drop that dehaze a little bit. Maybe I'll even drop the exposure or raise the exposure a little bit. Don't want to go too far, just something like that. Now I'm going to click OK and it will adjust this one. We won't see anything change on screen until I click the little eye to turn that off. And now you can see much more light coming through the center there. I need to use the center part of this image and I need to bring it through this one. And the way to do that is with a mask. Select the top layer, apply the mask from the bottom left of the layers palette. There it is. We need to select black from the bottom of the toolbox. 
we need to select a standard soft edged brush which is what I have there we can see the size of the brush if you look up at the options you can see the opacity is set to 100% so is the flow with this little icon checked I can change the flow with the number keys on the keyboard so I'm going to drop that down to something like about 20% then I'm going to use the square bracket keys to make my brush bigger and there I just want to lift the tones in the center by just painting gently onto the mask and there you can see the painting appearing at the top right and it's just lifting those tones nicely through that middle distance where I think we need them now if you look down at the bottom left of the screen you can see that I'm currently saving this layered file it's a little bit slow saving because I'm saving it onto a USB stick if I was saving it directly to the hard drive of this particular computer it would be a lot quicker but the reason for me mentioning that is like I said a little while earlier if you can walk away and leave this image maybe come back in a couple of hours or even overnight quite often it really is a great benefit is very similar to when we sit down to type a letter and if we read our letter when we've completed it we read right over missed words completely we miss all the spellings and we miss all the typos too come back the next day and we spot them all well image editing is no different now the reason that I like to work with both of these layers which are independent to each other is they're both smart objects which means when I sit back and look at my image and decide I do want to make a little change here and there I've got the ability to do so very quickly and easily and without losing any quality looking up at the sky at the top left one of the characteristics of infrared is it tends to make blue sky rather dark well I think it could go even a little darker than that and what I could do is to select the thumbnail which is sitting at the top of the stack remember the one beneath we're using the center portion but this one we may need again if we want to darken the top left now I could flatten these two layers together and use the burn tool on the sky but another option is just double click the smart object after all that's the benefit of having the smart object then maybe we could select our adjustment brush I'll just click and drag just to put the pin in place so I can hover over the pin right click and reset local correction settings because all I want to do here perhaps is to take the blacks down a little bit maybe even a little bit of exposure and just darken that top down just a little more some of the benefits of using smart objects and I can look around the image make my brush bigger or smaller if I felt there was one or two other areas that I needed to adjust maybe on the edge of the picture you get the idea and when I'm happy I can click OK and because I know I've got both of those layers saved at some stage of course we do have to commit this and I'm gonna say flatten the image even though we have lots of versatility with working with smart objects I'm still a fan of the dodge and burn tools here I'd like to use the dodge just a little bit I'm gonna select it from the toolbox on the left hand side there's the dodge tool there you can see the brush rather big I'll just make that a little smaller using those square bracket keys to the right of the letter P from the options at the top of the screen I'm going to select highlights maybe mid-tones to start with I was looking down at the tree line coming in from the right hand side so maybe that's a little bit more of a mid-tone than a highlight the exposure well let's try bringing this up to about 10 percent doesn't have to be pinpoint accurate because what I want to do is just lift the tones there a little bit maybe a little bit in the reflection maybe a little bit in the clouds there and just the odd area here to just draw our attention up you can see the sort of thing these things are very very personal and then perhaps into the tree just lifting the tones gradually 
and maybe we could select highlights next drop that down even more make a slightly bigger brush maybe just a wipe across the highlights there in the sky just to make it a little bit brighter water in the background you get the idea we do have now quite a strong contrast we've got some interest we've got good composition there's one thing I'd like to do before we say that the image is complete now I would save my image before I move on but I'm going to take a look at what I can achieve with this image with Nick filters now I downloaded the Nick filters when they were offered free of charge about a year or 18 months ago I'm not entirely sure if they still are available but it may be worth a search on Google to find out because they're pretty good so I'm going to go up to my filters menu at the top left of the screen I'm going to choose my Nick collections and the one I want is Silver Effects Pro over a period of time I've become quite a fan of these filters and there's one or two that I tend to go to straight away surprisingly one of those that I use quite a bit is the one here that's labeled underexposed now in this situation it's obviously far too much but in some other instances of monochrome images it works a treat and of course if you look over to the right hand side you can accept let's say 80% of what this preset gives you and then you can adjust the brightest brightness contrast and structure to get it a little bit lighter but another option I like down here are these two high structure harsh and high structure smooth so let's select it and we get a preview there's the smooth version so which one of these would we like best this one or that one there's not a massive amount of difference and it's going to be purely personal I think it doesn't really matter let's just pick one and go with it but what we can do is go up to the top left of the screen click compare that's what I created that's what the filters doing look how it's bringing out the detail in those clouds it's giving me another 10% of appeal in the image am I overstating that I don't think so it's looking pretty good I'm gonna go down to the bottom right click OK to open this up and you'll notice you've got many many changes and tweaks you can make to the preset on the left but I found that 99 times out of 100 it works perfectly okay now when the image pops onto the screen of course you can see that not only does it apply that lovely effect and just take us that little bit further in our quest for a sparkling monochrome but it does so on a new layer so it leaves our original intact there's the original there's the Nick filter adjustment I've had a converted infrared camera since 2013 and within a few weeks of getting the camera converted I wished I'd done it sooner infrared opens up another very interesting and creative part of our photography if you're watching this video on YouTube don't forget to subscribe below and hit the notification bell so you're informed when I post the next video this video and many others are also available as a download from our website I'll put a link to our site below these are standard mp4 HD videos the very same ones that we upload to YouTube like the one you're viewing here but you have the convenience of them right there on your computer desktop and why not check out our photographic and audio visual forum too we're not a large group and you'll be made most welcome I'll add a link below to the forum thanks for watching